colleagues, to our students, uh, to our guests. Um, I have the pleasure, unfortunately, for the last time to welcome you to these uh, nice uh, Chinese Luxembourgish webinars with report of experience from our colleagues from Wuhan and Shanghai. In this uh, final version, we have the honor to uh, welcome uh, Professor, Professor Zhu uh, from uh, the uh, Renmin Hospital, which is affiliated to Wuhan University. Uh, Professor Zhu is himself specialist for uh, emergency medicine and in, in intensive care. And uh, he will report us on uh, his views on uh, management of these uh, critically ill patients. Uh, during uh, his talk, of course, as always, uh, those who are listening to us uh, are enabled to send in questions by the chat function of the YouTube channel, uh, which will be sorted and uh, forwarded to the speaker by uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Xinking Mao, uh, who is a little bit uh, the brain of uh, these uh, webinars. Um, after the uh, talk of uh, Professor Zhu, there will be a panel discussion uh, that will be animated by uh, two experts from Luxembourg. The first uh, one is uh, Dr. Pascal Stamé, uh, who is a specialist for anesthesia intensive care and who is the medical director of our emergency uh, department uh, in the sense of uh, out hospital emer emergency management. And the counterpart is the second panelist, uh, Dr. Emil Bock, who is head of uh, the uh, emergency department at the Hospital uh, Robert Schumann and um, currently also uh, president of the Luxembourgish Association of Intensive Care Doctors. So uh, I won't uh, monopolize uh, the microphone and hand it over uh, several thousands kilometers from Luxembourg to our distinguished colleague, Professor Zhu. So many thanks for having accepted uh, this uh, uh, invitation. We know that this is additional work for you and uh, over hours because we are already late evening in China. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you uh, for your uh, uh, induction. Uh, thank you, uh, Ascala and uh, Emily. Uh, it's my pleasure. <coughs> And I feel so happy uh, this evening uh, or the afternoon. Yeah. We were online to discuss the COVID-19 with the professionals from Luxembourg. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the title of my lecture is the key points in the treatment of critically ill patients with our coroner's pneumonia. This <coughs> uh, or the COVID-19 my way use. Yeah, I'm a frontline front doctor or expert in Wuhan in hospital. So how can I? Uh, yes, and uh, you can control your slide. Okay. Uh, I want at the bottom, to at the bottom show. of the screen. At I the bottom want to show of the my screen. own. Yeah. Okay. I want to show my. Uh, no, own you don't need slides. You, you don't need. Uh, can Professor you? Yu, you don't need. I will control for you if you want. Yes. Okay. So, can you see yes. clearly? Yes, we see very clearly. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Just let me know. Okay. Let me go on. Okay, the topics about COVID 19, especially the uh, severe and the critical uh, patients, uh, I think, including number one, 
how to distinguish severe and critical type. And the second, how to carry out respiratory therapies. And the third, is any intubation beneficial or harmful to COVID-19 patients? Uh, about the fourth, it's about shock and the resuscitation. And the fifth, when and how to sedate the patients. Uh, the next is when and how to use with prednisone. And uh, the seventh is how to use antibiotics. And eighth, use blood purification correctly. Or uh, the lines is, is the ECMO is the life saving straw. And the last, I want to <coughs> discuss the early or the EEN, the early and the adequate nutrition therapy. So, the characteristics of severe and critical COVID-19 uh, in Wuhan, the critical patients or the severe patients, uh, the characteristics including is the elderly patients, usually elderly, and uh, with high BMI and with underlying disease, usually more than two underlying diseases. And the patients usually is uh, fear or so worried about the outcomes of their disease. So this is the characteristic of patient. And the, 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 about disease characteristics, number one, I think the uh, the the patient usually have had frequent dry cough. Influencing talking, eating, drinking, and sleep. So, mm. this point is about or linked with the nutrition, the sedation, and the uh, blood volume or the shock management. The second is this player with high respiratory rate always respiratory distress and the third multiple nodules and bilateral GGO on the urine. So as to the management, I think the first one is the underlying disease are usually neglected because we usually emphasize or focused on the COVID-19 and the second is high driving pressure with the ventilated uh, in the ventilated patients especially in long invasive invasive patients and the C core compliance of treatment no matter the patient receive mechanical ventilation and CRT or ECMO D the exposure life support requirements usually last for a long time. And the E, deep station was used extensively in many severe and critical patients. So, <clears throat> when we faced a COVID 19 patient, we usually distinguish the classification or the types of the patient. Uh, according to the China Management Guideline for COVID-19 version 7, <clears throat> the COVID-19 was divided to four types. The mild type, common type, severe, and the critical type. Mild type patient just has fever, dry cough, but no CT scan evidence for of GGO. <clears throat> and the common type, uh, fever, dry cough, and bilateral GGO on CT scan, but have no uh, upwards display. The severe type, one of the three items. 
one is the uh, is clear respirator frequency <coughs> is above 30 BPM and the blood oxygenate oxygen saturation is below 90 30 percent and the PF is uh, under 30 uh, 300 mm uh, MMIG and uh, all lung infiltrates is more than 50 percent within 24 to 48 hours and the critical pipe <coughs> is uh, if the patient uh, with one of the three items first one respiratory failure need mechanical ventilation and uh, the second with shock and the three with an ODS or an OF and lead critical care. Uh, in my work uh, in the Jingying Tan Hospital, I find uh, this classifications or this criteria uh, maybe is too crude. So, and uh, uh, this criteria or the classifications may lead to delayed of intubation and mechanical ventilation. So, <clears throat> according to my experience, uh, I presented my criteria here. Yeah. Uh, because, as the title said, uh, this is a video from my experience. So, uh, in this slide, in this lecture or in my slides, there is uh, very few reference, just is my views and experience. So, <clears throat> as to my criteria, the severe type, I think if the patient is a comfort NCP or COVID-19 plus the three items as follows. The patient can be diagnosed or, <clears throat> uh, as the severe type. The first one is the temperature. Temperature is usually above 39 centigrade, last two, or last more than three days. And the second, at rest, uh, the patient feel is clear or the uh, respiratory rate more than 30 BPM. And uh, uh, also at rest, the SP, SPO2 is under 95%, but above 90%. As this criteria, <coughs> the national classification is under 93%, uh, but I think my criteria is more suitable for the severe uh, type patient because if we <coughs> extend the range of SPO2, we can find or him <coughs> Uh, we can find that the, these patients who can progress rapidly to the critical time. So these patients will be not delayed for intubation. And the four, PF is under uh, 300, but above 200. Five, if the patient receive HFNC or NIV, the, even though the SPO, uh, uh, even though the maximum parameters, uh, the SPO two is still under ninety five percent, or even the SPO two is above ninety five percent, but respiratory rate is above 30 ppm and a six bilateral GGO 
the seventh, the seventh, more than two chronic disease or more than two underlying disease. The eighth, more than 70 years old. And the nine, secondary one organ dysfunction or deterioration of a stable chronic organ dysfunction. And the 10, the lymphocyte decrease persistently. So if the patient <coughs> with uh, three items, uh, I think, Patients can be divided in, divided into severe type. On this base of the severe type, uh, if the patient progressed the the right criteria, at least two items, so the patient can be divided into critical types. <coughs> Uh, first one, uh, at rest, the RR is above 40 BPM. And uh, the, if the patient received the maximum parameters uh, with HN, HFNC or NIV, uh, the, the respiratory rate is above 30 BPM. And the BPF is a <clears throat> continuously decreased to under 200 and for no chronic disease patient uh, this point is very very important uh, in fact in my lecture uh, two months ago uh, I present or I show uh, the autopsy pictures of the lung uh, to illustrate the, to explain or explain these items because if the patient no underlying disease but the PSO2 uh, elevated more than uh, 40 uh, 50 that's mean the pathology of the lung is so serious, yeah. And the, the, the MMV, the minute ventilation, is decreased seriously. So that we this this patient should receive intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation. This is the fourth one. The fifth one or the fifth point uh, intolerant to HFNC and the NIV. In my experience <clears throat> in Jin Tan, no one who is intolerant to HFNC and the NIV could recover without IMV. So this point is also important. The sixth one is GGO's progress more than 30% or fused together in 24 hours. And the seventh secondary two organ dysfunction. Yeah, as to severe type, uh, I think just one organ dysfunction. Uh, in here is two organ dysfunction or deterioration of stable chronic organ dysfunction and then the ACE with shock or hypertension. The nice lymphocytes decrease persistently and the 10 body weight loss quickly, loss quickly, body weight loss quickly. Uh, this point is also as important as the Fourth and the fifth, I think. So, uh, the three questions how to carry out the respiratory therapy. Uh, I think the first one we should emphasize 
we cannot use the HFNC, NIV, and the IPPV or IMV and the ECMO step by step. Yeah, we must think uh, think about think about the patients. Yeah, the patients underlying disease. Yeah, so uh, in Wuhan, the HFNC, uh, the HFNC usually HFNC usually as the underlying therapies uh, of uh, respiratory care, but usually this. Uh, the patients receive HFNC and it's in NIV, usually delayed intubation, uh, usually intubate, uh, uh, delayed intubation. So these treatments may inappropriately delay recognition of the need of intratracheal intubation. I think it's not may, it's sure, it's sure in fact in our work, yeah. So I suggest strongly uh, to give this patient who is not intolerant HFNC and the NIV intubation as early as possible. And then if the uh, ARDS is too severe, uh, we should give the patient from position. Uh, at the first stage uh, of the pandemic in Wuhan, yeah, there is a way of the early intubation can cause death uh, quickly. So uh, here, uh, early intubation and the invasive mechanical ventilation harmful to patient with COVID-19 or beneficial to these patients? I think yes, <clears throat> because it can improve the efficacy of MV. Yeah, uh, I think the refractory hypoxemia. Refractory hypoxemia yeah, is uh, plays the key role of the deterioration of these patients. So intubation can improve the efficacy of M MOV and the oxygenation quickly. Uh, it can uh, we can carry out the PEEP and then to improve oxygenation and uh, prevent interstitial and uh, alveolar exudation and uh, edema to avoid elevate organ injuries due to refractory, uh, refractory hypoxemia, especially the uh, myocardial injury, I said. Yeah. And the, uh, in the, the IMOV can or the intubation can reduce energy consumption by reduce breast work, uh, uh, breast work, and avoid aspiration due to NIV. Yeah, and to uh, uh, the last one is to make the patients comparable to EN, but also the germ to when the patient receive. Deep sedation. So, uh, why intubation was usually delayed in critically patients with COVID 19? Yeah, at the first stage, uh, we lacked of PPE. Yeah, and uh, with few knowledge of this new uh, virus and uh, this new. Uh, this emerging uh, infectious disease. I said, many doctors 
fear of being infected. And the third one, uncertain of time to incubate because we have no knowledge of the pacific allergy of this emerging disease. So, and uh, the doctors was unable to perform because, you know, uh, the patients, the number of the patients is too huge. Yeah. Uh, we have no best to receive to the media uh, to receive these patients. And uh, the doctors and the nurse is not enough to care for this huge number of patients. So uh, different discipline or different departments, the doctors come to together, yeah, <clears throat> and to, to, to work together. But not every doctor received or have the ability to perform incubation and uh, can use uh, ventilator. So many doctors are unable to perform the incubation. And uh, different discipline and a different idea, different opinion about this issue, uh, this problem. The next, how to do it in critically ill patients with COVID-19. Uh, this is my protocol or my methods or my experience. Before intubation, uh, we'll try my best to keep the SPO2 above 90, uh, 95 percent, even though it's impossible usually. Yeah, and the second, using positive head hem helmet. Uh, this is uh, uh, it is available. The head helmet is available. Uh, I think one month later, before the beginning or the beginning of the pandemic. <clears throat> so the and the three suggest to use muscle relaxing drugs. And the five warning dilation before muscle relaxing. Uh, after the patient receive analgesia and the sedation and the muscle relaxing drugs, <coughs> the uh, EF and the, and the uh, tombs of the vascular usually <coughs> decreased and then the subsequently the BP usually decreased. So uh, we usually if a smaller or uh, 500 milliliters infusion yeah, to allege the water. And uh, then when the intubation is successful, uh, we usually give the patient deep sedation. <coughs> Uh, the first mode of ventilation is PSM and the SPO2. Uh, uh, usually, we keep above ninety-five percent. And here, I want to emphasize: we usually give low PEEP and uh, low peak pressure <coughs> uh, because. Many GGO is under bureau. So if the PEEP if the PEEP is set according the reference from the Lancet, according the FIO2, 
uh, a part of patients may progress to viral trauma. Yes, viral trauma. Mm. And the last one, uh, almost every patient receive from partition. The full problem is shock and the resuscitation. I think during the early phase, the shock is uh, hypodermic shock. So the patient should receive <clears throat> infusion of Christoloid solution. And in the late phase, with the bacterial infection, the, the shock, it belongs to septic shock. So during this phase, antibacterial and uh, was present and the fluid resuscitation is almost important. And the five, when and how to sedate the patient. Uh, I think the sedation should be given to all confirmed critical COVID-19 patients. Those patients usually have anxiety or usually is so nervous worried about so much, yeah, and the fear to the outcome of the disease. And the strain enhanced, <clears throat> those patients usually with enhanced sympathetic tone. So if the patient receive long invasive respiratory therapy, such as HFNC and NIV, we found that the meditone medium is very suitable for these patients. But if the patient receive intubation and the IMA or IPP, we usually give the deep sedation. Uh, this protocol, yeah, uh, or the laboratory, yeah, is uh, designed for a uh, China expert consensus of analgesia and uh, sedation for the severe and the critically ill, uh, critical type patients with COVID 19. Yeah, uh, it's designed or, uh, by myself. So I will go through quickly. Yeah. Uh, the first one, if the patient complain discomfort, no matter if his pain, anxiety, or delirium, and it's in, uh, we should. Uh, what we should do? We should improve the environment, increase family's radio vegetation and uh, satisfy the patient's demands and the music therapy, yeah. This music therapy is not the surrounding music, but maybe uh, give the patient a, a telephone uh, or a, an Apple uh, or a Huawei, yeah. <clears throat> and the, if the patient still feel uncomfortable and then we should give the patient assessments of pain, agitation, and uh, do delirium screening and uh, assessment, assess the sleep disturbance apparently, separately. So, we use NRS for HFNC and NIV or BPS or support for IMV and the ROS for 
agitation, assessment. When the patient receive HFNC, NIV, or IMV, or ECMO, yeah. Uh, we use BCAM for the urine screening and uh, use RCSQ for the sleep disturbance assessment. Yeah. Uh, at the pain, opioid, opi opioids, as their first choice is also the first choice, but uh, in consideration of the safety and the weak analgesia effect of dexamethotermidine, uh, yeah, it is best for HFNC and the NIV with a conscious patient. So as to the agitation assessment, we should keep the loss at negative 1 to 0 to HFNC and negative 1 to positive 1 for NIV. Yeah. Uh, but as to the echo, we should give the different <coughs> score as the target with a different situation or different phrase, phrase of the echo. The little screening, uh, the first one we should do is to remove causes of the little. And uh, the second, we should discharge, discharge the patient for ICU as possible. That we can, yeah. And the third, not use haloperidol period, yeah. and improve sleep disturbance. The last one is also the dexamethotomidine. Yeah. Sleep, sleep disturbance is a very serious problem uh, in the in this patients. So we should give the patient psychological and uh, humanistic care. Yeah. Uh, I think this is the first or the basic or the primary care yeah, with this patient. And two, maintaining, maintaining normal sleep, awake, rhythm, and then controlling Noise, controlling noise, especially during the pandemic. Many ICUs is set up. <clears throat> so, and the uh, the last ear plugs and the music, and then combination of opioids uh, and uh, BZ to reach target. And uh, enzymes can be used to, to reduce the opioids dose if the uh, analgesia is leading for a long time. We usually combine with little muscle blockers or little muscle blockage and uh, the tenor loss at at negative five to four, in just who receiving IMV in prone position or with patient <coughs> ventilator dyssynchronic and uh, this echo is anticipated to use uh, or maybe to be used more than two weeks, and those who will receive invasive procedure, uh, such as intubation and the uh, bronchoscopy. The loss should be kept at negative four to negative five under such situation. DSI 
should not be used in COVID-19 patients with severe ARDS, especially with patients with later dystrophy, but can be used to those with who require long-term and deep sedation. Drug types and those should be adjusted according to change of hemodynamic and organ dysfunction personality. So, as to uh, analgesia and uh, sedation, I think the principles including uh, analgesia and sedation severe and critical COVID-19 patients should be along with the principles of guidelines and uh, consensus. And the second, the strategy should be individual personnel for each different patient. The third one is the strategy should be flexible and creative. Last one is psychological and communicative care is important and necessary. Uh, the six, when and how to use massive credit in solo. Uh, First one against the mild and the common type. Uh, I've treated a doctor who received a large bond mesocardiosoma when he is just present. Uh, the presentation is just. Uh, Clinical manifestation or presentation is just so mild, more than 200 milligrams per day. Uh, and uh, the outcome is, is so sorrow. Uh, low dose in severe type part of it. Yeah. But uh, I have experience uh, in, I think, more than, more than 20 patients, yeah, experience for more than 20, or more than 20 patients. Uh, I insist uh, these patients especially the severe patients at the door when they express the phenomenon uh, who indicated or suggested they are progressing from severe stage to critical time or severe time to critical time. Uh, the seven when to use antibiotics. Treat the mild and common patients at the CAP. But in Jin Tan Hospital or in the uh, critical care department or general ICU in the largest hospital, such as my hospital, the patients usually uh, the length of the critical type patients usually exceeded more than two weeks. And with lymphocytopenia and with characters, usually more than three casters on different positions. And they usually receive mechanical ventilation or transferred from other hospitals to our department with intubation, yeah. And you usually receive <clears throat> different dose of mesoprotisone. And it's in with underlying disease. So, the infections of those patients in my ICU usually belongs to edge 
save life. Hospital acquired infections or ventilator associated pneumonia. So, I think the antibiotics should be elevated according to the cultures or to the <coughs> bacteria uh, or to the epidemic allergy of the hospital. <coughs> the germs usually be <coughs> checked out or be tested is MRAD or CRE, especially CRKP. <sighs> At this problem, uh, many doctors from respiratory department usually reject or uh, the elevation, elevation of the, or escalation of antibiotics in COVID-19. But they did not distinguish the type or did not distinguish the stage of those patients. So I think at the first stage, I also <clears throat> uh, object the uh, escalation of antibiotics. But uh, during the late phase, the patient must receive advanced antibiotics. And eight, use blood purification correctly. Uh, first, uh, I want to emphasize most of most AKI are perennial. Yeah, uh, the RRT is used to for adjust for the balance of fluid and the electrodes and the acid base and LPS absorption. Just uh, used, uh, it's just used uh, on fewer patients because the lack of Source. So, plasma exchange is also used in few patients. The force is less acidic, uh, less is more, or as early as possible, according or less to the API. So, we can discuss later. Five is ECMO the life saving strong. ECMO is just a uh, symptomatic treatment like MD. Uh, in my opinion, I think because there is no proven drugs to the virus and uh, we have few knowledge about the passive knowledge or we have no or the whole exact knowledge about the mechanisms uh, of the passage. Yeah. So I think uh, the respiratory therapies, no matter the HFNC or the NIV or IMV, or echo. It's also uh, just the symptom, symptomatic therapy. So the virus are still at the end, at the bone, and uh, produce at least if the info site decreased persistent. Excuse so, me. Professor, the virus you? cannot be cured and uh, cleared. Excuse me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 你可以你可以把声音说大一点吗？然后把你后面的风扇关掉，因为我们这边基本上听不太清楚。你把你风、okay. 后面的风风扇关掉，然后把声音打大一点。Okay, sorry. Yes. No, it doesn't matter. 
I know it is very hot in Wuhan. So for our audience, it's very hot in Wuhan. So this is why we use the. Yeah, it's better now. So speak louder, so our audience on the YouTube channel can hear you better. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, it's much better. Thank you. It's much better. Okay, continue. You can teach you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Very well. Very well. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Please continue. And you can take your earphones out from the computer. You can take your earphones out. 只用耳机的声音，只、okay. 用电脑的声音，这样你就可以听到我了。Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Please continue. Okay. Can you see my slides? Uh, yes, I I put the slides on the full screen, so you don't need to share your screen. So I can show for okay. you. Yes. Okay. Please, okay. please. Uh, and the third, if the virus cannot be killed and cleared from the lung, the lesion cannot be absorbed. How can the patient be rescued? Yeah, that's my opinion. In fact. <clears throat> The so survival rate of ECMO uh, in Hubei uh, is lower than twenty uh, percent, uh, and then nutrition therapy in severe and critical COVID nineteen. So, uh, Uh, we should comply with the main principles of guidelines of ESPEN and uh, ESPEN. Yeah, we should carry out uh, early interior nutrition or early interior nutrition at uh, supplying uh, supplying uh, per interior nutrition. Yeah, that's possible as we can. And then to reduce the frequency, to contacting with the patients to avoid the risk of being infected. Uh, the third, uh, the fourth is also to reduce opportunities of the uh, equipment contaminated, and then continuous infusion. Yeah, if the patient receive an EN. But a lot bolus infusion. Uh, even though we emphasize uh, the importance of EN or EEN, we should know the threshold of perinterior nutrition because uh, in the classification or my criteria, uh, you say. I said uh, this patient's body weight usually decreased very quickly. <clears throat> so we should lower the threshold of PN. If the patient cannot be carried out with EN or EEN. So uh, this is a special tool. tool. Yeah. Uh, I draw the two uh, uh, into colors. Yeah. Uh, uh, the blue, yeah, the blue one uh, is uh, placed in uh, in the gastric, and uh, uh, the end of. The red one, yeah, is put into the or uh, or past the uh, yeah. 
So the blue wire is used for suction of the gear ray, and this one is used for uh, the red one is used for EN. Uh, this picture display um, the end of the first week uh, when I stayed at the Jin Nan Hospital. Yeah. So summary, uh, the treatment of severe and critical COVID-19 patients should be carried out in ICU. And the early intubation is the most effective and the practical necessary to correct fractured hypoxemia. Mesprednisolone is beneficial to a part of patients, not all patients, yeah, because it can inhibit <coughs> the immune uh, immunology, yeah, immunity, uh, immunity, yeah, and uh, the force is upgrade antibiotics or uh, escalation of antibiotics. It's reasonable in critical patients with COVID nineteen because the length of hospital hospitalization or the stay of ICU is too long or usually exceed two weeks or three weeks. Uh, the blood purification is useful, but the aim must be clear. Yeah. The COVID-19 involves several disciplines, so MDT is very, very important. And then welcome to Wuhan. Wuhan is very safe now. Yeah, welcome to China. Thank you so much. Well, thank Hello. You. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Gilbert, we cannot hear you. You cannot hear me. We cannot hear from Gilbert. Uh, so, 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 so. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, great. Thanks to Professor Yu. Uh, just for our audience, before Gilbert set up. Uh, the, the, the microphone again. I, I want you to say a word. Uh, just an additional uh, presentation for our uh, speaker today. So Professor Yu Zui, uh, he is the Deputy Director of the Department of Intensive Care uh, Unit in the Renmin Hospital. Uh, and, and he told me that he is a doctor of intensive care unit who is highly motivated and excited when he meets the, the, the patients in critical illness. So um, this is why that uh, he saved a lot of lives in Wuhan and uh, on behalf of uh, a lot of families, I want to say thank you uh, for many reasons. So you, you deserve... Uh, this, yes. Okay, Gilbert. <laughs> uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I, I don't know what happened. Um, it doesn't work. So let me uh, maybe introduce you again, our uh, experts for the panel discussion. We have invited Dr. Pascal Stamel, uh, director from Direction Medi uh, Medical et de la Santé, CGD, and also, uh, and also Dr. Emily Bock. Uh, unfortunately, I fear that maybe Dr. Emily Bock, he has uh, urgent emergency patient wait, waiting for him, so he is not uh, ready to come yet. So. Uh, Je vais donner la parole à Pascal, peut-être. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, now he's better. Ah, fantastic. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but uh, I switched off and uh, I made the wrong maneuver. That's the problem of those born last century. Uh, so, Professor Zhu, uh, I wish to express, first of all, uh, my respect to the uh, extraordinary work that you made all these months uh, time 
in uh, Wuhan and then of course uh, warm thank you for sharing your extensive experience with uh, our colleagues over here in Luxembourg and in the greater region as we call it uh, together with the surrounding uh, countries. Uh, actually, Chen King uh, made already the transition, so uh, I won't introduce uh, our panelist. Uh, so please, uh, Pascal, uh, you open the fire. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, kind introduction, and thank you very much for this uh, very impressive uh, presentation of a uh, person that is uh, the first time to feel the presentations. And uh, I think when I read already the, the questions, I think we should uh, uh, keep in mind that at least what I understood that uh, in the first uh, weeks of this pandemic your hospital system was uh, overwhelmed by the number of patients and the, the treatment perhaps could not be done like it uh, would be done in the normal conditions. And so uh, in, in this context, there is just one question I have uh, regarding the invasive ventilation, mechanical ventilation, the intubation. Uh, it's one of the questions also in the, that has been asked uh, through the chat. Uh, you state that um, uh, that um, the patients would benefit from early intubation and the mechanical ventilation, which is a little bit uh, counterintuitive what is uh, uh, generally done uh, in, in, in such cases. And I've also talked to some of my uh, colleagues uh, that told me that there are some patients that benefit from non-invasive ventilation or H uh, C. Uh, perhaps not those that are involved to critical patients, if they really become critical, I think they should be incubated. Uh, but I think one of the problems you encounter is that uh, a lot of patients had to be treated by physicians that were not uh, trained to, um, to, to care of these critical patients. So could you comment a little bit on your, um, uh, on your opinion on early intubation of these patients? Yes, in, um, in fact, in your question uh, involves several questions. Maybe we can start from the, this question that I put on the screen. Uh, so this one is uh, also related to the paper that uh, Professor Yu uh, just published in the Journal of Intensive Care. So we read from the data that uh, most of the patients of COVID-19 in the ICU unit in Wuhan so received finally the invasive ventilator in, instead of non-invasive ventilators. So what are the reasons behind that? And sometimes uh, you also perform uh, a transfer in, in intubation directed to patients. I, I know that you have a special reason, so please make some comments. And then I will switch to the second question that uh, Pascal just mentioned. Yes, please. Uh, well, sure. Yes, uh, you should have that. The question five, why most of the patients of COVID-19 in ICU you have received uh, received invasive ventilators instead of long invasive ventilators. Yes. Uh, uh, there are several re reasons. Yeah. Uh, at the first time or at the beginning, the uh, uh, doctors from respiratory department. Uh, uh, management managed the patient in the world. So, uh, uh, in the first stage or at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, many patients uh, belong to mild, yeah, belong to mild or common type, yeah, but with the with the progression of the pandemic, uh, the severe and the critical type 
COVID 19 patients increased uh, so quickly. Uh, you know, uh, in ICU, we just uh, admitted the severe COVID 19 uh, patients. Uh, from my experience, uh, when these patients receive long invasive ventilator, uh, the first problem is that the uh, their nutrition is deteriorates. Yeah, uh, or in other words, uh, the body weight. Yeah, the body weight lost very quickly. So, if the patient receives long invasive ventilator or ventilation, yeah, the nutrition cannot be carried out enough to meet with the need of the body. So, patient receives intervention, we can carry the EN, yeah, immediately and to improve the nutrition of the patient. Yeah. This can shorten the ICU stay and the hospitalization. This, I think this is the, uh, the first one. Uh, the second is directly uh, to improve the oxygenation and uh, uh, to decrease the higher uh, PSAO2. As you know, uh, too many critical patients uh, with COVID 19, yeah, when they received the NIV, yeah, the, the drive pressure is usually exceed 30, 30 or 40, yes. And these conditions, the viral trauma cannot be avoided. Uh, I have a data, uh, I have a primary data, yes. Uh, there are more than 40 patients have viral trauma when they receive low NIV with so high drug pressure. Yeah. In one month, in one month. But this data uh, has not been published. Uh, this is the second reason. And uh, three, we find the mortality with long term NIV is higher than the uh, NIV is higher than HFNC and uh, the IMV with the small samples. Yes. And the fourth reason is the balance of the oxygen need, yeah, and the oxygen supply, yeah, is disturbed or is unbalanced, yeah. So the intubation and IMV can reduce the respiratory work of the body especially under the condition with enough nutrition. Yeah, I think that's my answer. Thank you. So now I will publish the, the second question uh, that Gilbert asked. Uh, so uh, the, question, the question is here. Can you see it where, mm, Professor Yu? Okay. Maybe Gilbert can make some comments. Yes, okay, I was uh, 
Just wondering, uh, what is your policy regarding ECMO? Because you mentioned that it is a symptomatic treatment. Uh, we entirely agree, of course, that we just uh, may correct oxygenation without uh, killing any virus with it. Uh, so, uh, actually, it's a two-part question. The first uh, part is, uh, in those cases where you switch to ECMO, did you use a venovenous ECMO or a venoarterial circuit? Okay. Uh, uh, in our the in our cross, uh, study, yeah, uh, in Hubei, uh, many or the more than ninety um, percent patients received. Uh, Venus Venus ECMO, yeah. Because uh, we and the other professors found, even though the myocardial injuries uh, exist, uh, even uh, serious, but the EF or the output of the heart uh, is not. To know, and the myocardial infection uh, injuries usually involves the right heart, uh, the right ven ventricle. Yeah, so many patients receive ECMO as weather winners type. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, actually uh, we had no, no such numbers uh, in my former department. Uh, but uh, given that uh, there are these reported cases of viral myocarditis and uh, given that there seems to be a relatively high prevalence of uh, pulmonary embolism or uh, distal micro uh, thrombi, uh, would there be a place uh, for veno-arterial uh, model because this would better supply uh, the right heart failure?那个你放一下吗？嗯，yes，so静脉静脉动脉这个ECMO的话就可以减少血栓，就是为了避免血栓，因为很多新冠的病人最后发现他们是死于血栓，主要是这个问题，就是考虑到避免栓塞。嗯
一个高非常高龄的一个状态，对于这一类患者，尤其是当这个患者存在一个呃，就是这个 pulmonary hypertension 的情况下，就是肺高压的情况下，以及右心功能衰竭。Uh, so, uh, please allow me to translate into English uh, on live again for Gilbert and also other people who are interested in this question. So, in conclusion, uh, Professor Yu, uh, he wants to mention that uh, to you um, use the ECMO uh, on the critical ear patients, uh, and in at the same time uh, use anticoagulation uh, agent is more important than. And use uh, choose which type of the mo which mode uh, is more important than the mode because anyway we need to uh, do the anti calculation uh, otherwise it's impossible for the moment it's difficult to prevent this kind of uh, pulmonary uh, thrombosis or the the the, the heart uh, problem yes so it's yeah, it's more yeah. efficient than we the pulmonary hypertension. Yes, yeah. hypertension. Yeah. Yes, to combine uh, the 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 anticoagulation therapy uh, when we use uh, when we apply ECMO. This is his position. Uh, he, he he think if we only uh, choose one uh, choose another mode, we think is is efficient. No, he think we. Need to do the anti calculation at the same time. This is his position, yeah. Mm. Yeah, uh, if we have most of us uh, switch to the venous venous SECMO for uh, respiratory failure, this is also uh, due to the uh, complications that you get on the arterial um, cannulation side if you cannulate the femoral artery. Uh, the only question that remains open is. When there is uh, a right heart failure, um, you may worsen it with the venovenous model because you pump mm -hmm. more blood into uh, the right part of the heart and you ask for uh, an increased uh, work of uh, the, uh, the right ventricle. That's uh, the issue. But um, I agree that it is uh, probably advisable to anticoagulate whatever. <laughs> Uh, the uh, companies uh, selling us the tubings may say about the heparin coated tubings. He says in the left heart failure, you can choose to use the ECMO, it may be more difficult to get the problem. Yes, I think this is... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes. He agrees with you yes, in the right heart failure yes. situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I agree with you. Yeah, on this point. Yeah, uh, before we choose the mode of ECMO, we should give the uh, uh, echocardiography of the uh, mm -hmm. heart. Yeah, uh, when the, there is right heart failure or right heart dysfunction and uh, the high. The high pulmonary, uh, the high pulmonary hypertension, yeah. Uh, uh, we we choose we a ECMO journey, yeah. Okay, uh, Pascal, you, do you have something to 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 mention? I. Sorry to disturb. I, I remember you had something to say. No, I think we should perhaps proceed to the other questions from, from the audience. If we're okay. to go, I don't have any other. Okay. So I switch to the first question. Uh, so the first question is coming from a, um, a doctor from Mans. So he 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 wondered uh, in the so the the, the current uh, emergency program of COVID. Uh, make a lot of burden to our doctors, surgeons, and medical students and nurses because they are not trained uh, at the beginning at all uh, for for the, the, the ICU of COVID, uh, especially for the patients who have already some some underlying diseases. So, and in your in your presentation, you point out. Uh, 
it must be admitted that the patients arrive too late in intensive care units when they were in critical condition. And uh, this should make us think about the general, uh, maybe reorganization of care with supervision by, uh, by the doctor of intensive care. Uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, I think uh, we, we face the same situation in our emergency department. Yeah, because uh, many doctors and nurses come from different departments because uh, they have uh, different criteria or they have different skills or skills or experience in assess a patient with COVID-19. So uh, it cannot be avoided that uh, some patients uh, may be uh, missed, uh, may be missed, uh, uh, assessed, assessed, yeah. Uh, in the ED, yeah. So, uh, some patients may be delayed uh, with intubation and uh, receive uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. Yes, that's true. Uh, so, from your point of view, Pascal, for the organization management, do you have some some comments on what we have done in, in Luxembourg, for example, just for exchange yes. with Professor Yi? Yes, but I think that the situation here are absolutely not comparable uh, because our health system, which was we had time to prepare, uh, was uh, not uh, overwhelmed at any moment uh, with patients. So it's a completely other situation than. Uh, the situation that presented in uh, Wuhan at the um, uh, start of the pandemic. Uh, but I think that the general approach is correct that if you have a critical patient in the emergency department, it should be evaluated by a critical care physician uh, to at least give his opinion if this patient um, is uh, capable of staying in a, a normal ward or an intermediate care unit or instead uh, should be transferred to, uh, to an ICU. That's a general approach. But I have another question uh, regarding the, um, the situation in, in Wuhan. Uh, the patients that were admitted to the intensive care unit were most of them coming directly from the emergency department, so coming really critically ill to the hospital, or were most of them already hospitalized uh, in another ward and they deteriorated uh, in the second phase? Uh,于是兄，他的问题就是在武汉的话，如果是COVID的病人，他们是直接去急诊，还是说会有专门收治这个新冠病人的呃，就是呃医院？OK，就第一批开吧，急诊。手发症状的是吧？对对对。OK，
Yes. Okay. And then, so, so the pressure uh, of the doctor, the doctor's pressure uh, in emergency department is too huge. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I I can understand. Yes. So. So it seems that in Luxembourg, Pascal is not the same uh, management style. I think it's not the same. Uh, yes, but uh, well, the situation was, I think, a little bit uh, different. Uh, but uh, now I think that uh, we're close to such a system. If you have a patient with COVID-19 symptoms, you will have a screening and you will be isolated uh, in special units or special rooms. Um, and then you uh, go to the war where we should go because the numbers, the numbers still lots of are uh, very low uh, the COVID-19 patients. I think that the situations uh, are, were completely different uh, for the, the, the care of the patient. Okay, if you're not, I will go to the, the, the next question. Um, uh, yes. So, the, this question is uh, for uh, uh, secondary infections. That means that patients, they, they are initially uh, not COVID-19, but when they go to the hospital for other disease uh, treatment, they get a hospitalized acquired infection. Uh, uh, yes. So. Uh, have you evaluated the incidence of these secondary infections which prolong hospitalization and the worst uh, the, the morbidity, it, it, especially when the patients, they have already uh, a problem like obesity, aging, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Uh, it will be more difficult for, the do for doctors to control the situation. So what are your opinion behind? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I already mentioned the uh, HAI, the hospital acquired infection, or the uh, uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. Yeah, in my lecture. But we have not the primary data. Yeah. Uh, and uh, no data published about. Uh, the HAI, yeah. But in many, uh, uh, in the in the best population, yeah, uh, more than eighty, yeah, more than eighty percent uh, have the uh, uh, bacteria uh, or the. Uh, Nosocomia secondary infections, according to the clinical criteria. Some patients have no the uh, um, verification of the bacterial culture or PCR or NGS because uh, the ability of some. Um, germs room or bacterial room of the laboratory department yeah it's so it's lack lack of the lack of doctors enough doctors to perform the cultures or pcr or ngs at this time yes uh肯定提到了但是我没有相关的数据但是在我们死亡的病例中也有百分之八十以上都是根据临床的诊断都是符合院内感染的但不是每一个病人都有细菌学的这个证据或者结果因为当时的很多医院的细菌实在医院里头它不
都有细菌学的资料，有一小部分人有。但是我们去临床是可以诊断它有继发的细菌感染的。Okay, so, so uh, yeah, briefly can conclude what he just mentioned in Chinese. So he confirmed that this situation really exists uh, in his hospital where he is working uh, because uh, they are a part. They are part of patients. Uh, they. The, the, the screening results show that they, they, they get the, the, the virus uh, during the hospitalization, but due to other, uh, other reasons, uh, not all the hospitalized uh, patients have, uh, have received this kind of screening, and we, we don't know exactly uh, if all of them uh, have, have, this, have, have, have been infected. So, so Professor Yu is working on this since the situation in Wuhan has been stabilized. So they are working on this data and try to publish to share experience with others. Yes. Okay, I, I will publish the question from Gilbert. So which is your strategy for winning? When and how do you use uh, tracheostomy? <laughs> tracheostomy, okay. Uh, uh, which is your strategy for winning? Yes, uh, the first uh, way to uh, evaluate or assess the nutrition uh, situation of the body uh, of, of the patient. Uh, and then we should uh, evaluate or assess the heart, heart or myocardial function. Yeah. Uh, especially the right part function. Yeah, uh, this is the the second. Yeah, and then is the uh, oxygenation. Yeah, uh, due to blood gas analysis. Uh, if the uh, uh, the heart function or the Myocardial function uh, is okay, and uh, the oxygenation uh, is also okay. Yeah, and the nutrition is improved, then, uh, uh, then the incubation, yeah, uh, before the incubation, yeah, we will think about winning. And uh, the step one, we will uh, discount the ventilator, but keep or maintain incubation. Uh, we usually use HFNC uh, at the next uh, or as the substitute yeah, for IMV at this time. Yeah. If the oxygenation is or uh, uh, still is okay, yeah, uh, we will think about to uh, uh, consideration the uh, uh, winning. Yeah, that's all. To satisfy for you, Gilbert. <laughs> the oh answer. yeah, perfect. Okay, so I I. I, I will publish the, the another question from Pascal. So I let Pascal to, to, to ask the question directly. So uh, some uh, teams use uh, prone position or a lateral position in awake patients that are not incubated, uh, and they have reported some uh, good uh, results with that. Do you have any experience or an opinion about the prune position in a way and not intubation, not mechanically ventilated patients? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. The prone position in weak and a lot intubated patients is suitable. Yeah. And uh, uh, what carried out especially uh, in these patients we receive HFNC. Yeah, uh, we find uh, prone provision in the 
HFNC patients is also beneficial to improve the oxygenation. Uh, is uh, especially in this patient in the uh, severe, not critical type. Yes. Okay. Um, I will go to the next one. Uh, so there is a question concerning the the, the, the usage of um, of the uh, sorry, uh, uh, donum. Whether it's too late, maybe we 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 should start to use it. Uh, from the moderate stage. So I, I think you have already mentioned in your presentation, maybe you can repeat it again, explain more in details. This is uh, a question from audience. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. Mm. Uh, in my experience, uh, uh, during the moderate stage, uh, the uh, uh, nucleoside decrease uh, more quickly than in other uh, than than during the severe and the critical uh, stage. But during severe and the critical stage, the leukocyte decreased uh, continuously or uh, persistently. Yeah. So the, uh, <clears throat> during the moderate stage, yeah, the, uh, the immunity decreased uh, so far, so, uh, and the mesoprenosome can increase the uh, immunity. So uh, we object to the use of mesoprednisone uh, during the moderate stage or in the, in the, in the patients with moderate. Yeah, sometimes. Thank you. There is another question also related to the, 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 the antibiotics. So let me show you. So, uh, so from our audience, um, there is a doctor ask in Europe, we follow the recommendations of our government and the health uh, authorities for the severe to critical patients with start a systematic antibiotic therapy of the C3G type third generation. Uh, the question is whether you have proceeded in the same way um, and uh, what about uh, your opinion also concerning the hospital uh, acquired infection uh, if we use this kind of therapy whether it will facilitate the, 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 the second infection yes please oh I usually think the uh, recommendations or the guidelines or consensus is just to point out the direction, yeah, the direction of our treatments. Uh, but uh, when we visit the country patients uh, with severe or, or critical patients with uh, COVID 19, we must. To, uh, we must make plan of uh, antibiotic uh, personnel, personally or individually. Yeah, uh, to the HAI or WAP. Yeah, uh, I think uh, several factors or several risk factors indicate the possibility of the nosocomial infection or hospital or acquired infection yeah, occurred in this patient. Why, why can we use advanced uh, or systemic 
under the audit yes such uh and you find java Oh, OK OK uh, 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 重型和危重型的这一类患者，我们已经有许多的危险因素可以来指示或者来提示这个患者已经发生了院内的感染。嗯，为什么我们不可以全身心的用一些广谱的抗日素呢？OK, oh, oh, okay. so so I I translate again. Uh, it's it's easier from. Uh, for, for our audience to understand. So Professor Yu, he, 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 he wants to mention that uh, the general recommendation from the government or health authorities is just a baseline. Uh, it's a guideline, but we should uh, practice the personalized medicine. We should uh, give uh, the therapy uh, and uh, tailor our treatment patient to patient. Uh, we cannot uh, stay uh, as a robot, so we need to be flexible. If the, the, the laboratory uh, evidence show that the patient has already been infected uh, after the hospitalization, in this case, we need to apply uh, the best treatment uh, instead of just follow the, the recommendation in general way. So this is his uh, strategy. We need to be flexible and apply the best treatment case by case yes so uh, Gilbert if you know and Pascal if you allow me to continue to the next question we have still two three questions yes okay uh, there's another one uh, so this one uh, this one in fact they they, they mentioned that uh, for the for the healthcare professionals all around the world, uh, we, we, we live in a, a constant uncertainty uh, and we have to learn on the job because this disease is new for all of us. And we face a lot of stress, not only for patients and also for ourselves. So in the past, also from our uh, speakers from Shanghai, uh, they show us that a lot of lawyers, they, they are not involved in the ICU before, and now they have to make uh, unusual special shift and join the intensive care unit specialized for COVID-19. So what was the situation in Wuhan, in Lenmin Hospital, uh, or in Jintang Hospital, uh, if if you also have a lot of staff that they they never work in, in this situation before and uh, whether they are quickly uh, be, be, be efficient yes okay. master uh first i want to say uh the mortality or the uh, survival rate of uh, uh, critical type covid-19 patients uh, differ from different ICU or different hospital because, uh, as you know, uh, we have general ICU and the professional ICU, such as uh, the NICU, the CCU. Yeah, so uh, during the pandemics. Uh, many professional ICU is all uh, uh, was really modified uh, to uh, suitable for uh, uh, admitting the COVID nineteen patient, but uh, the knowledge of the uh, the, uh, the professionals or the nurse especially the world, not doctor, yeah, the, the health care uh, worker knowledge of critical care medicine is also, also different from 
different ICU. In Jinghan, uh, such as my ICU, is just a simple and uh, so poor condition at the beginning. Yeah, when I when I and my team arrived at the Jinghan Hospital, yes, and uh, the nurse called from uh, different hospitals from the, uh, our country. They received the different training and they experienced different patients uh, in their own ICU. So we must learn to cooperate with each other and adapt to the method and experience uh, or the customs uh, of different nurses and uh, different doctors. So the mortality of severe and uh, critical patients is different from each other. Such as in my hospital, Renmin Hospital and the Zhongnan Hospital of Wuhan University. Yeah. The mortality may be no than that of Jin Tan ICU. Yes. So as to the on job training, I think we have low time. Yeah, and no energy yet yeah, carry it. Uh, so, so you mean you you have not organized uh, this kind of training? But I think people involved in the work they they take initiative to learn by themselves to to be to be ready when you yeah. meet them. Yeah, yeah this is. Uh, my,我的意思是，上面的那么多的大量的微中患者的时候，我们没有足够的重症医学的critical ICU病房里头来，那么在这里的微中病人的成功成功率或者死亡率，肯定和本专职的医院里头的generalist或者说department of critical Okay, so so just in, in one sentence, he, he mentioned that uh, in each hospital, uh, they have their uh, ICU unit. Uh, so all the staff already trained and ready to receive intensive care patients. But when the pandemic, uh, COVID arrived in Wuhan, uh, we need an much more uh, healthcare workers than usual. So a lot of uh, healthcare workers from other departments and units also from other hospitals just uh, group uh, a team rapidly, quickly. So they uh, they, they don't have time to, to be trained. And uh, at the beginning, Professor Yu, he tried to train them uh, in a short uh, notice, but uh, when a lot of patients arrive, thousands, uh, ten thousands, uh, they just don't have time. They have to 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 save save uh, lives, at, and and then he he feared that uh, compared to the, the normal ICU units, uh, this new uh, new uh, uh, ICU unit uh, really uh, worked well, even though. Uh, there are some patients they died at the end, but we have to our best. It's just uh, because of the time uh, constraint, and uh, we cannot do better for the moment. This is human, so they try to train, but uh, we have too much patients. It's just impossible to to train. Yeah, so, so we do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
In fact, I designed a questionnaire about the modified ICU or the simple ICU uh, for the uh, modified or simple ICU uh, healthcare workers for the doctors and the nurse from uh, from the country. Yeah, and I will submit the result for publication. Yeah, I I I a 临时 ICU 里头的工作体验的一个问卷调查，那个结果我已经都给你出来了。未来的话，就是可能在两三个月、两个月之内吧，我们会提交。Oh, okay. So, so now since the situation is stabilized, he he tried to spend some time to do a conclusion retrospectively, uh, and he just submit uh, 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 a survey and also. Uh, what he has prepared as a protocol for this kind of temporary ICU. In the future, if there is another pandemic or epidemic of infectious disease arrive in, in our city or in, in other cities, we can maybe uh, inspired from this kind of protocol or experience. Yes, he, he prepared something to share. Maybe this will be published after the peer review in two or three months. Yes. So he just mentioned this in Chinese. Okay, so I have a last question uh, from the audience and I will, uh, I will show you and then, yes. So the last question is, uh, yes, is, so is we, we wondered what is your opinion on the psychological problem in particular for the patients of COVID-19, they stay in the ICU for one, two weeks or even longer, but they cannot be surrounded by their relatives and their loved ones during the, the pandemic. It's, it's especially difficult for them because they, they lead their relatives and loved ones, but uh, they cannot. So what is your opinion how you have performed in your hospital? Okay, first, uh, I'd like to show uh, how I did during the pandemic, yes. Uh, when I uh, when I went to the isolated ward, yeah, the first thing I need to uh, uh, I must do I must do is to shake hands with the patient. Yeah, you shake hands with the patient, and uh, uh, I usually put in uh, you won't die. Yeah. You will die. Yeah, this is the first, the first thing. And the second, I usually uh, communicate uh, by the WeChat. Uh, communication soft uh, is so popular in China. Yeah, uh, with the families. Yeah, and uh, I will let the families or the relatives of the patient uh so i uh, the doctor is yeah stayed uh uh stay uh, are staying with their family uh, or their relatives yeah and uh, three uh, i usually told the nurse must find out the most requirement or the most uh, psychological need of the patient. So uh, some patient may be worried about uh, the deposit, yeah, uh, in the bank, or the, uh, uh, they are lost baby, yeah, or their respective uh, uh, parents, yeah. So we will let the patient communicate or uh, carriage a uh, radio visit, visit with their families. Yes. And the uh, so patient uh, like to uh, listen music. Yeah. A special music or opera. Yes. Yes. It's not easy, but I, I, I feel that you, you, you did well. Yes. So just uh, just a word for WeChat. WeChat is a, a social media software like WhatsApp. 
or MSN Messenger or Facebook in China very popular. So Professor Yu, he just mentioned that he meets the relatives and uh, send messages instead of patients to, to their relatives and loved ones via WeChat. Uh, so this is uh, so on top of the, the, the follow up on patients in uh, daily routine life, and he spent his time uh, chat with the relatives. I I know that he work from in the morning very early and finish very late. So he has also wife and uh, and the kids, and he don't have enough time to spend uh, to spend time with uh, his family. So. I really have a great respect uh, to you and uh, the sacrifice that you did uh, for this special period. Yes. So, uh, Gilbert and, uh, and Pascal, do you have any other final remarks before we end up our last but not least of webinar? <laughs> Let's start with Pascal. Uh, well, uh, anyway, I would like to thank you uh, for this uh, excellent uh, talk and the insight in this uh, and in this process in the hospital. And uh, I also would like to thank you on behalf of all, all you did. And uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, if I may add a short comment. Uh, although we are living in a fancy period where everything should be categorized uh, based on uh, published evidence uh, fit into guidelines when a catastrophe like this uh, explodes over our heads uh, finally uh, there is no help with uh, prospective randomized trials patients are coming by dozens and uh, the doctors have to react uh, to the best of their knowledge and to the best of uh, their skills. So I think it is uh, very important from time to time uh, to go back uh, from uh, science to bedside and also to listen to such huge clinical experience as you reported us today. So I thank you very particularly uh, on behalf of all practicing doctors. Hey. Yes, I, I also want to thank, uh, give thanks to Pascal and uh, also other, other health workers uh, in the country because yesterday there is uh, a newspaper uh, published an article named Comment uh, le Luxembourg est devenu un laboratoire d'une gestion efficace du coronavirus. So in English is how Luxembourg uh, become uh, uh, a good laboratory of the, the efficiently management of the coronavirus. So I think this is uh, due to the, the, the good coordination of different uh, colleagues in Luxembourg. So uh, uh, great thanks to all of you. And uh, uh, also I want to thank Gilbert give me the opportunity to run the webulas uh, since uh, 1st of April. <laughs> we, have, we have finished uh, until today. 19th webula together is uh, just incredible. And, uh, and I feel very lucky to, 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 to learn on the job uh, and meet all these uh, experts uh, all around the world, yes, from different countries and cities. Uh, Gilbert, do you have some words to say before I... <laughs> yes, I thank already, uh, our invited uh, guest speaker. I thank also Pascal for taking the challenge to animate uh, the discussion. And then, of course, uh, I wish to mention that uh, there are some uh, positive collateral aspects uh, of the COVID crisis. For instance, uh, you, Jan King, you started to work at the university on 1st of April, and you uh, were at your office for the first time uh, on uh, Tuesday. So Tuesday. <laughs> uh, that means that uh, it is possible to do a tremendous amount of uh, work in a remote fashion sitting at home. Uh, this is uh, perhaps something that uh, many of us have learned in different professional sectors. We, uh, as uh, university at least, have 
relatively positive experience now uh, with uh, remote teaching and uh, maybe it is not uh, the exclusive way to go uh, for future because for several things uh, the uh, direct contact exchange with, between students and uh, teachers is uh, necessary uh, but uh, somewhere we are living uh, nolens volens as said uh, the uh, latins uh, kind of uh, uh, paradigm shift that happened so uh, we will see during the coming weeks and months uh, which look will have the post-covid uh, era i think uh, all of us uh, agree that uh, if there isn't a second wave with uh, covid disease there will certainly be a second wave with all those patients with non-covid diseases who definitely got under treatment, under follow-up uh, during uh, these uh, few months of crisis and who are waiting to get now access to uh, fair uh, care for their problems. So um, if uh, this is uh, more or less the final word, then uh, I wish once again also to thank uh, the man behind the curtain, Philippe uh, <laughs> um, uh, Trabu, uh, who has helped us over all these uh, weeks and months uh, with uh, solving technical problems with these webinars because as long as we stay in Luxembourg it looked rather easy but once we uh, went over the Silk Road it made it a little bit more complicated. Uh, yes, um, I think Philippe he is trying to log in again. <laughs> because uh, I, I I really want to give my thanks to him. Uh, I, I yes, uh, Philippe, you yes. you, yes, are I you? Hear you okay. So great thanks to you. And, uh, we forgot uh, all this time to mention also Asvin, who is oh, yes. coordinating uh, the quick uh, the click meeting uh, software together with the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And this is perhaps also the right time to mention that uh, these uh, webinars will be accessible through links on uh, the website of the university. So for those who wish to listen a second time or who missed uh, the one or the other webinar, there is an opportunity uh, for replay. Yes, and I have still uh, some words to say. I have a lot of words to say, but uh, I will choose the... the, the so uh, I, I would like to thank to our international relations office. So uh, they gave me a lot of support uh, on this uh, bridge between China and uh, Luxembourg. So with the help of uh, of uh, Chen uh, Chen Nei uh, and also Sylvain, we we have run we have been running different uh, topics. Uh, even we touch the topic of economics, that is absolutely not my specialty. Uh, so we we get a good feedback from audience and just from the feedback of uh, social media manager, they told me that uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, audience, they look at the YouTube channel at least once. So each, each uh, viewer, they 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 watch the, the, the YouTube movies at least once. So sometimes they come back again. So this means that the message and the information we, we try to deliver to the audience is meaningful. And this is what uh, we we want to uh, do as uh, as job. And at the end, I I also want to uh, share my uh, my feelings with the audience is that the COVID nineteen is uh, very disastered. Um, situation, but um, this is not a, a, a disease much more dangerous than the other disease, like the, the grip or, or flu. Uh, it's just we don't know this disease, the new disease, when the new disease arrive in front of our eyes, our lives, we we are panic, we, we have a lot of fear. So when we lose our calm, we will do a lot of wrong uh, mistakes. This is why our professionals, our health workers, they are not ready because of short of time. 
and uh, short term knowledge. So I think even if there are second wave or third wave, I don't wish it will happen. But in the case the worst thing happen, I think our our government of our authority they have already mitigated or, or fall back plan, and we are ready. I believe that we are ready for. Or everything. So I'm confident that we will win the battle together, hand by hand, shoulder by shoulder, and uh, nothing is impossible for beating heart. This is what I want to say. <laughs> okay, so then uh, it's probably not a farewell, but a goodbye, and see you uh, after summer because now that we have acquired some use to this uh, new tool, to this new way to work. Uh, there is no reason that we shouldn't continue to make uh, webinars on, uh, how would I say, uh, innovation in medicine, uh, new concepts, uh, new problems in public health and so on. So this is our task to see how we continue all this after the summer break. Yes, thank you again. We have to say goodbye. <laughs> it's difficult, but uh, thank you. <laughs> so see you, see you soon in Wuhan, hopefully. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well. Okay. Let's then take down the final curtain. <laughs> <laughs>